that narrative, but let's see if we can continue. Um, yeah, I probably needed that break. Uh, what happened was, as we were touring, uh, part of what I was doing, again, uh, this was a personal trip. This was certainly not in any way a research trip. <laughs> this, I have to go back and spend some months there uh, for, to, for me to do the, the body of research that I ultimately want to do around Ghana in comparison to other parts of Africa. But what happened to me, again, it was a very personal journey. I was trying to feel and experience everything. So as we're walking through the death cell, for women, and normally these were African women who resisted rape, uh, who refused to be raped, and who fought. Um, in this particular slave castle, Cape Coast, they were placed in a death cell. At Elmina, they were chained to a cannonball naked in the courtyard. Uh, but this particular place was a, was a death cell, and as um, this was being explained, there were a number of European, of, of white, um, individuals present. Now there was a young couple, a young white couple, uh, that were clearly emotionally impacted by what they were experiencing. They were absolutely silent the whole time. Like, hence the contrast and understanding. They, they sensed, I, we need to be quiet here. We need to just not say anything. However, that's, that wasn't the case for everyone. And as they were explaining pretty much the agony of these women and how they were dying and how they died, uh, an older white woman broke in, broke into the conversation and said, yes, but look at the architecture. And I was, I can't even explain what, what happened to me. I looked at her. Now let me, let me try to explain what was going on, what, what she was doing at that moment, because it was so uncomfortable, you see. And it was a reflection of her of her legacy of, of European right. behavior. Yeah. And it was so uncomfortable that she decided that I'm going to just change the direction that this is moving in because I am uncomfortable. And that's white privilege, you see. Her white privilege exerted itself in the slave castle on the continent of Africa. Still, she felt like she had a place uh, there that would determine the direction we were going to go in. And of course, <laughs> I said to her, you don't get to do that. You simply do not get to do that here. And of course she was shocked out of her mind. Uh, I turned to the tour guard, guard, uh, guide and I said to him, I said, I don't need to be here with her. And I should not have to be here and tolerate her and her behavior. And he apologized. This gentleman turned to me, he says, I apologize for this. He says, there is a tour that actually separates people out and people who are of African descent, only people of African descent are, are participants in that tour. I said, I wish I had known that because this is painful and hurtful and inappropriate. So she, of course, became silent at that point. At that point, she became silent. But at no, at no point did she in any way <coughs> sense that she didn't have the right to change the direction I, do you, you, you don't understand how outside of, outside of anything I'd experienced uh, that I felt, in, I was enraged by that behavior. Here I am on the continent, in the footsteps of my ancestors, and this woman asserts her white privilege, even there. And, and so again, there was this, uh, this kind of, and again, there, not everyone, but this particular woman and, and another gentleman uh, went so far as to say there was a, 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 a man in our group that was about, he's got to be 6'5", 250, two, and we were in the courtyard. And this man, who was with her, by the way, stood behind him and said, oh, I'll just stand in your shadow and shade myself from the sun. This is what he said in the courtyard. Now, this was the wrong person to say this to because this gentleman turned around and said, oh, no, we did that for you for 400 years. <laughs> We don't do that for you anymore, right? And of course, he did. Oh, I'm, I, apo I apologize. Just no sense, you see, of any adjustment. Because when the world adjusts itself to you, you don't perceive any need to change your behavior. Because everywhere you go, everyone adjusts to you. Well, that wasn't happening there. And so there was an adjustment that happened the other way. 
So there was this process, uh, that was one of the first things that happened to me, where I really needed to say that. I didn't need to carry it in any resentment or anger or hurt. I needed to say, you don't get to do this. Not here and not now. And it, that was very important for me to do. It was very important in my own process of, of, of really trying to navigate my feelings and my emotions and this sort of thing. I, I've read of pitched battles that the Africans waged with the slave traders, trying to uh, get their, their family members who had been kidnapped out of those slave forts and back to the village. Did you hear about that? I did. I did. And there were actually a number of stories that were told um, about people who were captured. Um, one was uh, uh, Ya Santua, uh, who was an incredible woman uh, that actually fought back. Uh, against the, the enslavers who were trying to usurp some of the artifacts, one being the golden stool, which has a very, very important uh, place in uh, uh, Ashanti uh, culture. And, and not only that, but people who just knew, they said, well, we're going to die. We're, we're simply going to die before we allow you to do what you're doing. And many did. But there, again, there, those accounts are very, they're very well known there, but they somehow didn't make it here in our in our um, education about uh, how our ancestors fought fought back long before they ever got to the slave ships. You see, w there is no real distinct history of the the inland walk from the the you know the the interior of Africa to the coast. That was a horrendous uh, walk, and many died along the way. Many fought along the way. And those numbers, again, are, have been shielded from, from memory. And, it, and being there, you begin to understand. Uh, even when you, when you walk into one of the slave castles and there's, you know, the men are taken one way and the women the other. And they mention that often, you know, it's about 50 feet that they would rape the women in the presence of the men who were 50 feet away from them. They could not... To, to, to do thing, two things, to tell them, one, he can't help you. He cannot protect you. And that you have no power here. That we now have taken and broken your will. This was done almost immediately. The thing that I think was probably, uh, for me, changed my thinking around how I would have written the book. I, you know, when I wrote Post Traumatic, I, I started with, this whole idea of the transatlantic slave trade, but I didn't understand that first part. I knew it through books, but with what I know now, I would have written the book differently. Be I would have clearly. Uh, uh, okay, uh, let's take another break. Maybe I can recoup <laughs> from what I haven't seen, really. And so uh, it's impossible, really, to grapple with all of the emotion that you uh, are transmitting, much less what you went through while you were actually there, you know. Where else did you go besides the slave forts? You said you mentioned I getting into to, the villages and yeah, whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, there was um, several individuals that were with us, and one individual in particular who's, who actually was born there and took us to her village and introduced her introduced us to her family and to her to her village essentially and in in Ghana uh, it's matrilineal the culture is matrilineal meaning that you know, you follow the the, the the female the mother's line mm -hmm. um, and it was very interesting to see the real I mean they're very serious about